Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Irvine. My work title is President of the High Court. And while that sounds quite prestigious, the job is nothing of the sort. What I do is I arrange the work for the 40 judges who between them operate the High Court. Part of my role is to ensure that everybody who needs access to the High Court, as opposed to any other court, can get it and that it's provided to all in as efficient a manner as possible. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about the commitment of the judiciary and the court service, which is responsible for the building and maintenance of the courts throughout the country, to ensuring that the rights of persons with disabilities are respected and upheld when engaged with the administration of justice. Now, everyone who attends court presents with a different set of circumstances a varying degree of understanding and a personalised set of needs. We recognise that access doesn't stop at the level of physical access to buildings. We are of course conscious that access to information, the understanding of the court's processes and inclusion in the court proceedings needs to be provided in an atmosphere of equality. We recognise that our ability to meet the needs of all people with disabilities is fundamental to realising our international obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and in particular, our obligations under Article 12, which deals with equal recognition before the law, and Article 13, which deals with access to justice. So perhaps a good starting point for me is to mention the court's policy on accessibility, which says as follows. Our aim is to provide top class facilities for all users of the courts, including judges, staff, legal practitioners, victims, witnesses, accused persons, media and members of the public. Well, you might say that's all very well, but what are you actually doing to live up to your obligations? Well, to start with, the court service has embarked on a 10 year modernisation programme, which aims to involve all court users including those with disabilities, in the design and the delivery of its services. And one of the central pillars of the programme is to make court services more user-centred or user-friendly. As Michelle Bachelet, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights said in the foreword to the new United Nations International Principles and Guidelines on Access to Justice for Persons with Disabilities, persons with disabilities are among those left furthest behind. For far too long, they have been ignored, neglected and misunderstood and their rights simply denied. And she goes on to remind us that the principles and guidelines are an indispensable contribution to achieving justice for all. And when you look at the guidelines and principles, it's clear that what is required is a commitment which is tangible and real, and not only one that is aspirational in spirit. The UN principles talk about foundational issues such as capacity, accessibility of services and facilities, procedural accommodations, access to notices and legal information, substantive and procedural safeguards, legal assistance, equal participation in the administration of justice investigation of complaints and effective remedies, robust monitoring mechanisms and training and awareness strategies. And in the criminal and civil courts in Ireland, we are committed to ensuring that these rights will be upheld in a very practical way for people with disabilities. But talk is cheap and it's easy to espouse principles. Also, I think it's only fair to accept that we, the judiciary and the court service are still some way off to meet meeting our desired goal. And unless we take actual concrete steps to make the necessary changes to implement the guidelines in a meaningful way, we are simply not meeting our obligation to ensure that all persons, including those with disabilities, are able to access the courts in a manner which upholds their dignity. Every possible practical accommodation must be made to respond to the needs of a court user with a disability. Now, I'd like to spend 
a few minutes talking to you about two issues. First, I'd like to give you a practical overview of the mechanisms in place which might assist court users with a disability. Second, I'd like to speak very frankly about some areas in which I think there's a lot of room for improvement. I'm going to outline a few initiatives which we have taken and which I hope will show how committed we are to bridging the gap between the theoretical foundation of disability rights and inclusion and the lived experience of persons with disabilities who attend the courts. At the outset, it must be recognised that attending court, whether as a person with a disability or not, is an inherently stressful and difficult experience. It can be hard to know where to go, what to expect, how to interact, and perhaps these anxieties are heightened, particularly for those with disabilities, by additional current COVID-19 restrictions, such as social distancing and number limitations in courtrooms. In this regard, I would firstly recommend that any court user should read the Explaining the Courts publication, which is available on our website. It gives a range of information on how the court process works, including what happens in court, who's who in the court, and what happens after trial. There are information graphics or pictures which show where the various people sit in court and what role they play. This can ease anxiety ahead of attending court and possibly assist court users identify the parts of the process with which they may need additional support. Once a court user is aware of what aspect of a court proceeding might be difficult for them, a number of additional supports are available to accommodate people with disabilities. From a very practical standpoint, it is important to know how to access these supports. As a starting point, a court user should reach out to the court's disability liaison officer, who will then formulate a coordinated approach to ensure that every court user is accommodated in accordance with their specific requirements. We acknowledge that accessibility is not a one-size-fits-all project and that bespoke arrangements are often necessary. It goes without saying that a proper plan to best meet the needs of a person with disabilities might require the involvement of a range of people, including the disability liaison officer, the judge, his or her judicial assistant or usher, the court service estates management and its support staff. Some of the tools which we have at our disposal to respond to requests for additional supports include an interpretation service. In fact, legal history was made last month when a deaf person sat on a jury and deliberated on a verdict for the first time. The juror was assisted with, uh, I think it was two Irish uh, sign language interpreters. We also have, we also have wheelchair ramps available. Uh, we're able to rearrange courtrooms in advance to accommodate wheelchair users who have to give evidence in an unobstructed setting. Members of the public and those with cases before the court can adapt hearing aids to make use of induction loops, which form part of our public address system in the courtrooms of refurbished buildings. All refurbished courthouses have appropriate signage and directions at doorways and entrances and exits. Signage and contact details for court offices, particularly the newer ones, are all in Braille. And separate victim or witness waiting rooms are available. We also have video link facilities. Something which we are also aware of is the limited capacity that some people have for long and tiring court days due to factors such as illness, fatigue, anxiety or mental health issues. And we are able to accommodate such witnesses with shorter court sessions, longer breaks between sessions or a combined approach. We are aware that for some court users with disabilities, shorter court sessions may make all of the difference to them. It is really helpful if any such problems can be relayed to the disability liaison officer a couple of days in advance of the proceedings. As an organisation which inherited a large number of very aged buildings, the court service is committed to ensuring that the courts and court offices are physically acceptable and accessible to people with disabilities. This has sometimes proven to be a challenge given the nature of many of our older buildings. On the issue of access to court buildings, it is worth mentioning that the Criminal Courts of Justice was voted the best accessible building and also won the People's Choice Award for Ireland's favourite new building at the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland Awards in 2010. 
and all new court buildings are being designed with the highest level of accessibility in mind. But while that may be something to be proud of, it is of little consolation to people with disabilities who have to access and navigate our stock of older, in some cases historically protected buildings. And of course, access to justice for persons with disabilities goes beyond mere access to buildings. The United Nations guidelines inform our commitment to providing a court experience which accommodates the needs of every court user and upholds the dignity of each person. To this end, all new buildings are built in compliance with the requirements of the Disability Act 2005 and our Estates Management Unit is taking active steps to bring older buildings into line with accessibility requirements by installing wheelchair ramps, increasing signage and available information and assessing buildings on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure maximum accessibility to the facilities despite the challenges the older buildings may pose to this endeavour. We have made a particular effort to ensure that all of our publications and new court service website use plain language in a variety of languages and in a variety of formats. In some sections, however, of our website, the text used may be more legalistic because of the nature of the content. For example, court rules, references to legislation and court judgments. However, we recognise the importance of ensuring that our site is accessible to everyone and have committed to achieving compliance with the National Disability Authority IT Accessibility Guidelines. I would also like to address areas in which I'm motivated to seek development. I believe that court user groups are a great way of engaging with court users and finding out how our services and buildings could be improved to better meet their needs. And I believe it is essential that persons with disabilities be actively represented on those user groups. This is a project that I'm determined to bring forward in the High Court as a matter of priority. We need to have persons with disabilities play an active and influential role in the further development of our approach to inclusion in the court service. I am also happy to report that the Court Service Learning and Development Unit is presently working on a new training programme to be delivered to court staff and this will address the needs of persons with disabilities in terms of both inclusion and accommodation. Apart from this, members of the judiciary have access to training materials regarding the need to ensure that our service extends in an inclusive way to all persons, including those with disabilities. However, I recognise that just handing a manual to a judge is hardly the way to ensure we provide those with disabilities get the best service we can deliver. I believe that the members of the judiciary need to be trained concerning their obligations to those with disabilities and how best to meet their needs. When people attend courts, we want them to be in a room best adapted to their needs in front of a judge who is trained on the rights of persons with disabilities and in the presence of staff who are similarly trained. And to the extent that this does not reflect the reality of the experience of court users, I envisage the opportunity for timely feedback through the user group's structure. Apart from the UN guidelines and our own internal policies relating to the accommodation of persons with disabilities, we are also committed to upholding the principles of the 2020 Victims Charter and the provisions of the Disability Act 2005. Of course, persons with disabilities attend court in many more roles than victims, but the Charter is a useful document in outlining the accommodations which can be made, and there should be no reason why a flexible approach cannot be employed to both civil and criminal proceedings. And indeed, the advent of COVID-19 has proved that we are capable of a very flexible approach to the use of court courtrooms, which may be conducted in an unusual and often in remote circumstances, but yet still manage to uphold the principles of fairness. The 2020 Victims Charter describes the criminal justice system from the point of view of the victims of crime. It sets out their rights and entitlements to the services offered by the various state agencies working with victims of crime. The sections relating to disability say that we must first speak or write out to you in simple and easy to understand language, taking account of your ability to understand and make yourself understood. Second, we need to be sensitive to your needs if you cannot read or write very well. 
Third, we need to provide an interpreter and translation if English is not your first language so that you can take part in the investigation or to act as a witness in court. Fourth, we need to take your specific needs and requirements into account if you have any form of disability. And finally, we need to treat you with dignity and respect, whatever your gender, race, religious beliefs, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, age, nationality, disability, economic circumstances, marital or family status, or if you are a member of the traveling community. When you contact any of the organizations named in this charter, please tell them of your specific needs so that they can try to address them. As I've already said, we invite and urge all court users who may have any special needs or requirements, either in terms of accommodation or support, to make these known to the Disability Liaison Officer, because I can assure you that the judiciary and the staff of the court service are fully committed to the entitlement of persons with disabilities to access justice in the same way as those who have no disability. Before I conclude, can I take the opportunity to invite any individual or any representative group watching today's proceedings who feel they have ideas as to how we, the judiciary and the court service, can better meet our obligations, to let us know of those ideas, either by writing to me directly or to the liaison disability officer of the court service. Finally, I think it only appropriate to close this short address by acknowledging on behalf of the judiciary and the court service our obligations to the UN guidelines and by making a commitment to ensuring that our approach to accommodating the needs of persons with disabilities will amount to a lot more than a simple show of good intentions or a rhetorical declaration devoid of any practical effectiveness. Thank you very much. <laughs>